Thank you very much. Thank you also to the organizers for putting together an excellent meeting so far. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about work in heterotic string theory. Also, uh, sort of similar to the previous talk, interested and motivated by questions to do with string landscapes. Uh, and this will be work that has recently appeared uh, with James Gray and Callum Brody, both at Virginia Tech, and also work in progress that we're still trying to finish. So um, to put another uh, Hodge diagram of possible Hodge numbers, this is the Kula BL threefold on the board. Uh, this is a rich landscape of possible backgrounds of string compactifications, uh, a tool for exploring that landscape for Kula BL threefolds in a wide variety of contexts and different types of string theories has been geometric or topology changing transitions. The hope, um, which has not been, I think, fully realized in any corner of string theory, is if we understood how to dynamically, for example, transition through geometric transitions between various topological points in this background, this would give us a very powerful and complete view of what is possible for string theory and perhaps where our universe might end up somewhere in this, this uh, a range of dots. So for geometric transitions, we know that for Calabiaos, both threefolds and fourfolds that we know how to build, the vast majority of them we know are connected by geometric transitions. It has been conjectured that in fact, all Calabiao threefolds are connected by geometric transitions. And a bit more broadly, that all SP3 structure manifolds, the dropping of the Taylor condition, are also connected by geometric transitions. So just a quick reminder, topology changing transitions, the ones that are relevant for Calabia threefolds are conifolds and flops. In a conifold, we have a collapsing S3, which moves us to a singular limit of the geometry, and we can perform a small resolution, replacing that singular point with an S2 to get a new topologically distinct smooth manifold. So we have two smooth manifolds, Calabia threefolds on either side, connected by a singular Calabia. Um, really, there is, and this was actually relevant in Wadi's talk as well, there's actually always a trio of manifolds in play for any uh, conifold singularity because we can do uh, two different small resolutions that are connected by a flop. And I've denoted those here as X and Y, singular guy in the middle, and um, deformation side of the conifold on the right here. Geometrically, for Calabia threefolds, these transitions are very well understood and have been for many years. Um, they are also well understood field theoretically in some contexts. Um, specifically the work of, of Strominger et al. in type two. We have a very beautiful field theoretic understanding of these topology changing transitions as a branch change field theory. However, in heterotic string theory, which is the topic of my talk today, um, things are much more difficult. So the problem is that the theory uh, has not just a Calabiao background geometry, but of course it also has a gauge sector. And due to the heterotic Bianchi identity shown here, you are not allowed to actually turn off the gauge fields in the background, gauge fields slash five brains in the background, um, in order to have a consistent theory um, due to the existence of the three form. We have an anomaly cancellation condition, which let me ignore five brains for a moment, tells you that you must balance the second Turing class of the gauge bundle against the second Turing class of the cotangent bundle of your Calabia threefold. And so in order to satisfy these anomalies in a 4D n equals one heterotic compactification, you must also consider what the gauge fields are doing. If you add in NS5 brains, um, these also can contribute. So you could have either a vector bundle or an S5 brains in play. The important point here, though, is that if you want to understand a conifold transition in this context, you have more geometry that has to come along for the ride. So it's not just what does the Calabiao do. You now have to say, what does the gauge sector do across this transition? So we can't set the gauge fields to zero. Let's stay perturbative for a moment. Um, so we need to understand the change in the vector bundle. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, we need to understand the change in the vector bundle during a geometric transition in addition to the Calabiao geometry itself. And this has been a pretty large stumbling block for decades. People have looked at various approaches. So very nice work by um, mathematicians, uh, including Collins, uh, Pekar, Diao, Kuzov have tried to understand, so say, for example, for SE3 structure manifolds, how to prove that uh, tangent bundles to the manifolds will provide good solutions on both sides of an SE3 structure geometric transition. Okay. Um, older work by Candelis and company was interested in whether you could have bundles that effectively spectated through a transition. So they just try and change essentially nothing and take this thing through, could that work? And what you find in that context is that you screw up anomalies and also bundle stability sometimes. So aside from very specific contexts, i.e. the tangent bundle, which is only one of a very large number of bundles that you could introduce over this manifold, this is really an open problem. 
and it has been an obstacle in terms of understanding n equals one uh, conifold transitions in heterotic. So the motivation for this project was to try and understand what happens to the gauge fields in heterotic spring theory during a certain type of geometric transition. Um, I'm going to focus on conifolds here, though you could ask many of these questions about flops because of course they're related. Um, disclaimer is that in the n equals one theory, um, as I'll argue, these are some very weird field theoretic limits that we're approaching. So we are going to see things like tensionless non-critical strings, which are known to arise in various singular limits of the heterotic theory on a regular basis. So I will not be providing a full theoretic description a la Framinger of a heterotic n equals one transition. However, uh, as a first step towards that, we need to understand what geometries for the gauge fields could be smoothly or minimally connected across a geometric transition. So effectively, I want to back up just like in the, the type two literature, first we understood how to connect the Calabiaus, then we understood a field theoretic explanation for it. I'm gonna try and provide some geometry to describe how heterotic theories can transition through a conifold and then comment on some features of the field theory uh, that we can explore. So we're beginning in this talk with geometry. We wanna find a minimal modification of bundles that can traverse the transition. And we wanna look for convincing structure in the resulting linked compactifications. Um, it will turn out that the proposal that I will give will result in potential new dualities between compactifications. So what do I mean by duality? Um, because I'm mostly dealing with geometry, I'm not talking about the full world sheet theory. I'm talking about theories that appear to give rise to precisely the same four dimensional n equals one physics. Um, as a result, this geometric proposal, although it's not a complete field theory explanation yet, has new computational power in that I can have linked geometries that seem to give rise to the same physics, and things may be easier on one side of a conifold or another to compute various quantities. And also, um, this I'll provide evidence that there appears to be an embedding of the heterotic moduli spaces as H11 increases. So in the sense that if I can smoothly take a bundle from one side of a conifold to the other, um, this can take information about lower dimensional H11 moduli spaces and push it forward into larger H11 manifolds. So just a reminder, again, um, conifold transitions have two sides. We've seen this already, complex structure side uh, and a, a complex structure deformation. So moving in the complex structure, collapsing S3 to a singular limit. Resolution side, small resolution, additional Q1s in the geometry connected by a geometry that is singular only at points. So nodal Calabiao in the middle uh, and a number of singular points. Uh, as I mentioned, this is very well understood geometrically. So for things like toric complete intersection Calabiaus, we understand which guys are connected by conifold quite explicitly. And let me just provide an example that I'm gonna refer back to to do something concrete for the rest of the talk. Here is probably the simplest uh, Calabiao conifold that we could look at. Let's start with uh, the famous Quinte threefold, move it to a nodal point. In this case, I'm going to introduce 16 nodal points and it could be resolved as this particular complete intersection. Okay, so some explicit conifold in hand. Uh, in order to see this conifold explicitly geometrically, I can write the defining equation uh, of the resolution side of the geometry. So going back for just a moment, you can see that these columns in this configuration matrix, the 1, 1, and 1, 4, denote the multi-degree in a product of projective spaces. So if I explicitly write the defining equations of this manifold algebraically, I can rewrite them in matrix form. And this matrix equation on the coefficients here, x0, x1, these are the uh, coordinates of a P1, which can't both vanish simultaneously. So this has a solution if and only if this polynomial is vanishing. Here L is degree one and Q is degree four in the uh, quintic, uh, sorry, P4 coordinates. So this leads to a quintic polynomial that is singular. Uh, this is the basic yeah. argument for why these guys are connected by conifolds. Um, this is going, I'm introducing this at this level of detail because uh, these loci things uh, that are defined in terms of these defining polynomials are gonna play a role later when we talk about what happens to the bundle. Okay, so if we're interested in how bundles change across a conifold transition, let's start with the simplest bundles to begin with. Let's start with tangent bundles. Um, there, the topology change across the conifold for the threefold itself is well understood, of course. And we have that uh, the Hodge numbers change in the simplest conifold, H11 increases by one, the class of the additional small resolution Q1s. Uh, H21 changes according to how the Euler number changes. And the second Turing class of the manifold changes with the addition of a class of Q1s. Now you can also prove for simple um, H11 changing by one conifolds of the type that I'm writing down that uh, you can also describe how the cotangent bundles of the Calabi-Aus change 
And this will prove to be very suggestive for how the whole process is going to work that I'm going to describe with bundles. So as bundles on the resolution manifold, you can show that the cotangent bundle of the resolution, this guy in the middle, it effectively can be projected on to these additional P1s that have just sprung up in the geometry. And you can say, what is the remainder or the kernel of that projection? And it's this guy right here, which is actually the pullback under the small contraction of the nodal cotangent bundle. So this is not anything sort of surprising or super deep. It's saying, if you take the tangent bundle, the resolution, you kind of delete the P1s or look at what's left uh, outside of the P1 support. This gives you the cotangent bundle of the singular threefold. Okay, not very, not very surprising. However, at the level of a uh, short exact sequence describing how bundles behave, this actually looks familiar. So the feature I want to point out here is we have behavior on a curve. This is being effectively absorbed or you know, the, you're describing a relationship between a general bundle on the full manifold bundle on the curve. And then you're left with the remainder, which is singular. The reason that I want to highlight that structure is that this actually is exactly the same geometric structure that appears in another well-known process in heterotic string theory, the so-called small instanton transition. In a small instanton transition, you have an NS5 brain, which can be resolved into the gauge bundle. Once again, you have support of a bundle over a curve. Uh, you can take that localized contribution to the gauge sector and actually smooth it out, effectively absorb it into the gauge bundle. And this changes your gauge configuration. This can be uh, gauge group changing, uh, excuse me, gauge group changing, chiral index changing, lots of neat things can happen uh, in small instanton transition. The reason that it's relevant for this talk is because in general, um, you can argue that geometrically what a small instanton transition looks like is that you can start with a bundle here, I'm gonna call it V naught. You can absorb the effect of a five brain over a curve. I'm gonna describe that as a skyscraper sheet and be left with a singular object which can be smoothed into a complete bundle. So uh, to say this more simply, in order to perform a small instanton transition, you start with V naught, you absorb a five brain, you're left with V. The reason that I am highlighting that, oh, and as an aside, you can do this in a rank changing way if you add extra copies of the trivial bundle in the middle, but we'll come back to that in a minute. So start starter bundle, absorb five brain, get left over. Why is that interesting for this discussion? Well, if you look at the form of what's happening to the tangent bundle or cotangent bundle in this case of the threefold, you have the resolution cotangent bundle. If you were to view this as behaving like a small instanton transition, you are absorbing the effect of the P1s and you're being left with the singular uh, cotangent bundle of a quintin. So you can view this as looking something like a small instanton transition in uh, the case of the singular limit. So the conifold is behaving like a small instanton transition. I'm writing this over the resolution manifold to make this behavior very apparent, but of course, you can't divorce the cotangent bundle from the manifold itself. So this really only makes sense as a conifold in the singular limit. But let's use the resolution geometry as a guide in this manner. All right, so um, in our explicit example, this is just to prove that you can actually write this down explicitly. I'm not gonna go through the details of this, but um, if you begin with the explicit cotangent bundle for a singular uh, quintic, you can uh, write down the sheaf supported on the curve in this case for the 16 singular points that I chose. And you can combine it explicitly in terms of the morphisms involving these short exact sequences into the cotangent bundle of the resolution. Here, notationally, whenever I write in this talk OAB, this is uh, a line bundle whose first Turing class is given in this expansion in terms of Taylor forms on the P1s and the underlying P4s. Okay, so now I want to use the fact that I just observed that the cotangent bundle appears to be doing something like a small instanton transition in the conifold. And now I want to extrapolate what I need to do to the gauge sector in order to effectively balance out or continue the, the smooth control of this theory. So recall that, uh, let's start at the level of charges. Recall that the anomaly cancellation condition, if I ignored five brains for a moment, gave me this. So how are things changing in the transition? Well, it's clear that the Turing classes are changing in this way. Um, this was how the topology changed for the conifold in general. So if I want to continue satisfying anomalies, I need the gauge sector to change in the same way. I need to add the class of P1s effectively to the gauge side in order to balance out what's changing on the, um, the gravitational side. Now, if I just said, well, the conifold looks like a small instanton transition in terms of the P1s, a sort of natural guess of what you might want to do would just say, let me add a five brain contribution to the, the gauge sector, which looks exactly like the same P1 contribution I had in the gravitational sector. Let me try and just add the same things to both sides. 
if I could do that and perform a small instanton transition to sort of absorb those, those new P1 effects uh, into the, the resolution side, then I would be sort of doing exactly the same thing to the cotangent bundle that I'm doing to the gauge bundle, and that would at least satisfy charges. It turns out that that doesn't actually work um, because the small instanton map that you would have to write down uh, does not exist for cases of interest. And there's actually a pretty sort of simple to understand geometric reason for that, which is we're interested in bundles that are going to change in the sort of minimal possible way across the transition. And those bundles tend to restrict to the exceptional P1s trivially. So they don't have a lot going on over the P1s. So if you have a, a, a restriction to the P1s here of a trivial bundle, there are no maps between OP1 and OP1 minus two. So this thing does not exist generically. Something a little bit more complicated happens. So back to the structure of the confold, it turns out that if you're interested in what you can perform as something like a small instanton transition in the gauge sector, there is a natural set of candidate curves that the confold geometry hands to you. So there are in fact special uh, they non-cardiac divisors that appear in the nodal geometry. So if you are away from a nodal quintic, uh, remember that this, these L's and Q's, these were coefficients of defining equations on the resolution side that combined to give this nodal quintic in the zero limit. If you look at a locus that's given by two of those, for example, an L and a Q, L not and Q not equals zero, what you find is that in a smooth quintic, this is a smooth curve. And as you approach the nodal quintic, this actually enhances from a curve to a divisor. This is a funky divisor, hence the ve non cartier nature of it. Um, but this is a well-formed divisor inside the nodal quintic. Curve limiting to divisor in this case. One can show that there are always, for any conifold, curves of these types there are special curves associated with this on either side of the transition that have the property that effectively they're different is the class of the P1s. So these are things that are not quite the P1 class, but they are on either side. And here I've called them C res and C def. So these are on opposite manifolds, these curve classes. Um, this, in order to talk about this difference, I really have to be on the resolution side. So this is sort of pulled back to the resolution. Um, but this difference encapsulates the P1. Explicitly, uh, C def and C res algebraically are of this type. Okay, um, more than at the level of the classes, though, these special curves, if you put skyscraper sheets over them, are actually um, very special in that they can combine with the P1 class in a very smooth way. So, normally in a Calabial threefold, if you try and combine two curves supported, sorry, two brains supported over curves, that's not going to happen because two curves don't generically intersect inside a Calabial threefold. These uh, ve non cartier divisors, which are, are curves and the smooth limits, these are special in the, the sense that they actually can combine with the, the P1 class in order to leave remainder curves. So here I have the class of the P1s. This uh, crazy thing in the middle here, S, uh, the pullback S star, this is a pullback of the small contraction map. And I'm relating that to the proper transform of this ve non cartier divisor. For the purposes of this talk, what these guys exactly are is not important. The point is that I can combine a curve with the P1 class to leave another curve. This all actually happens in the nodal limit. I'm writing things over the resolution manifold to be explicit. Here's an explicit description for the geometry that I wrote down. Um, so the next slide that I wanna show you is to give you a feeling for what's actually happening to this gauge bundle in a way that allows us to track things. Uh, so I'm gonna present this at the level of classes just to not get lost in the details of sequences and sheaves. However, all of this has been written down explicitly in our paper. Um, all the maps, morphisms, what these guys are and their support is very explicit. Um, and what follows, I've included something called VS. This is called a spectator bundle, which just goes through the transition in a, a trivial manner. So nothing exciting is happening to that. So we begin with a geometry. Let's start on the resolution side, which is satisfying the heterotic anomaly. We now say that I can view the conifold transition itself as a absorption into the resolution cotangent bundle of a P1 class. I need to balance that out on the, res the, uh, the uh, resolution gauge sector side by the addition of the same P1 class. In our paper, we've described this line loosely as something like pair creation of these P1 classes. That's a loose statement um, because we're not actually doing the quantum mechanical pair creation, but effectively at the level of charges, what we are doing is introducing P1 uh, skyscraper sheaves, so uh, five brains or the small instantons supported over these P1s in a symmetric manner across the gravitational engaged side of the theory. 
We're then going to perform a small instance on transition in the cotangent bundle in order to get to the nodal limit. And we're going to accompany that by the small instance of transition in the gauge bundle in which this special resolution curve is actually emitted from the gauge sector. We can then combine it with the P1s in a way that we're left with the deformation curve. And finally, we can reabsorb that as a small instance on transition into the gauge bundle. So this is a lot of steps, but the basic idea is we want to symmetrically introduce the pair created P1s across the gauge and gravitational sector. And then the gauge bundle has to adjust in a way that unfortunately isn't just absorbing the P1s. These other curves have to come in play in a specified manner. And what we end up with is exactly the anomaly cancellation for a singular version of the deformation manifold, which can be then deformed continuously and smoothed back onto the deformation side. Okay, so that was a lot. Um, note that almost everything here are standard processes that are well understood in heterotic, except for the so-called pair creation process. Um, perhaps, however, this shouldn't be regarded as so exotic in that this process of introducing uh, the, the P1 classes, the curves or five brains associated with them, preserves all known conserved charges. And in such situations, processes are normally expected to occur. For example, brain antibrain creation. Unlike brain antibrain creation, however, because of the sign difference that's appearing between the gauge and gravitational sectors in the heterotic theory, this is a purely supersymmetric process. So supersymmetry is preserved. Um, this process concerns only known objects, and it can only occur in singular limits of the manifold. So in the heterotic context, this is really a story about brains at the singularity, which is hard, and maybe you would not be surprised that we haven't seen this before explicitly. Okay, so here's an example of bundles to go with our example geometry, just to be explicit, because I want to show you some numbers of what actually happens to the heterotic theory in this process. So if I begin with a bundle, which is a simple deformation of the, co the cotangent bundle on the deformation side, this can be decomposed into a spectator bundle of the following form, and effectively the small instanton contribution from this curve that I called Z-def, the special curve that's going to traverse the, the transition. Um, on the resolution side bundle, the resolution side, I have an explicit, again, monad description of the resolution bundle. Why is that important? Um, it's important only to show you this slide, which is what happens to the states of the theory. So here I focus on the singlets, but I can talk about the charge matter as well. In this theory, I begin with the quintic, which has Hodge numbers 1, 101. And I also have singlets coming from the choice of vector bundle, in this case, 324. So a total of 426 singlets to begin with in the theory. If you perform the process that I have schematically shown, what you find is that the Kähler moduli, complex structure moduli change in the expected way across the conifold. And the vector bundle moduli of the new bundle exactly adjusts to preserve the total of 426. So the net number of singlets is completely preserved in this process. Also, the charge matter um, we can prove is totally preserved as well. I showed this for one example, but we have a general prescription and proof in our paper that exactly which curves we need to pull off and reabsorb for a general conifold in order to have this type of matching work. So the fact that this spectrum matched across a conifold for gauge bundles is actually, um, this type of phenomena has appeared before in the literature, um, approximately 1997, I believe, um, Jacques and collaborators made an observation about 0,2 GLSM, which is that it was possible in certain 0,2 GLSMs, oops, did not do that, um, in certain GLSMs, uh, 0,2, you can begin um, in a geometric phase of the theory, move to some non-geometric phase, and realize that you can interchange fields in a way that leaves the theory invariant. If you then exit the, um, that non-geometric phase and move back to a geometric phase with your new field label, you end up with a different GLSM that looks like a completely different uh, zero two GLSM, but the states in the target space theory appear to be totally the same. So this is what was known as, as target space duality. Again, this is a, a observation about GLSMs, not yet NLSMs. And there's no complete mapping of all of the states. This is simply a field relabeling in one phase of a GLSM. So this has remained an open question. Is this describing you know, sort of a branch change in the underlying heterotic theory? Is this secretly some sort of you know, uh, heterotic, um, actual uh, heterotic duality in which you have exactly the same full string theories? That's an open question. However, for target space duality, you have pairs of geometries, manifolds, and bundles as described by the GLSM which are going to lead to the same target space physics. This has been studied, as I said, by Jessica Katru and then Blumenhagen later um, in lots of interesting contexts. 
um, you can ask for the process that I have written down where my spectra is matching. How is this related to target space duality? And upon inspection, the two bundles that I displayed earlier are actually manifestly target space dual. Um, I chose them as monad bundles precisely to make that illustration. You can do this stronger. You can actually say, all right, so target space duality just at a level of you know, field redefinition of monad bundles in a GLSM. Will every possible target space dual pair uh, follow the rules that I'm writing down? And we can show that for chains of conifolds, not necessarily one conifold, every target space dual geometry that we have looked at can be connected by a process like we're describing. And if you were to restrict yourself to monad bundles, then every um, uh, pair of monad bundles that we perform our procedure will be target space dual in the GLSM. So it's if and only if. Uh, I'm effectively nearly out of time, so I've only got a couple more minutes more, but um, can we actually see why this has happened? So the intuition is I've performed this symmetric pair creation process. I've used small instanton transitions to try and effectively symmetrize what's happening in the gauge sector and the gravitational sector. Why is this preserving the full uh, spectrum of the 4D n equals 1 theory? And at the level of geometry, we have a proof for why that's working. So generally, you can decompose a bundle into, um, you know that it must involve a contribution from these special curves that allow you to transverse the conifold. And so you can decompose it into a contribution from a spectator. And here I've written it as an ideal sheep rather than a skyscraper for technical reasons that we will worry about later. Um, but you can also write down contributions effectively from this fibrain support over the special curve. So you have moduli that correspond to mixing together a spectator and your fibrain, spectator and fibrain, moduli of the special curve itself. This would be effectively the fibrain moduli of a curve, the fibrain wrapping that curve, and then moduli of a spectator. And you can ask, how do these change um, under deformation to the smooth manifold? This is well understood. And you can ask, how do they change across the conifold? So it turns out that everything in the red box here, you can prove will always be the same on the two sides of the conifold. And in fact, the only thing that is changing its dimension is exactly the moduli of this special curve class, special fibrain moduli that allow you to move across the conifold. So this changes in exactly the opposite way to the Hodge numbers of the manifolds involved in order to preserve the number of singlets. So we have um, in varying levels of generality, assuming complete intersections, et cetera, um, for the Kalabiaus, we have a proof of this in general in our proof. Okay, um, that gives you a hint, and I'm, I'm almost out of time, but this gives you a hint that the thing that's really relevant here is the behavior of these curves and these five brains. So you can ask, could I drop the gauge sector entirely and just do this as a duality of five brains? So if I just try and satisfy the heterotic anomalies with five brains only, can I do that? And the answer is that yes, you can. So you can perform the whole transition and moduli mapping exclusively in a theory with only five brains. If you just wrap the five brains over these preferred curves, the entire theory uh, transitions through in a way that preserves all degrees of freedom. So this is a new conjectural duality that you can't understand um, sort of with normal GLSM tools. Uh, this wouldn't be, this doesn't follow automatically from target space duality, but it is the same type of effect. So to conclude, what I have given is a consistent minimal geometric process by which compactifications of the heterotic string can undergo conifold transition. There are many different things that you could mean by that. So just to, to clarify, I said earlier that, you know, tangent bundles go through the conifold and there you change the spectrum all over the place, right? In a heterotic theory, that would change all your degrees of freedom. That can happen, but what we're showing is that in the heterotic theory, there appears to be something much milder that can happen, which is there are simple classes of bundles where you don't seem to be doing much at all to the effective theory as you cross the, the conifold. This is much similar, more similar in spirit to what happens in type 2 physics for a flop, right? For a flop, you're not actually changing the type 2 theory. You're just relabeling, you know, a field goes from plus to minus. And so this is a smoother type of transition. We might conjecture, although we've not proven, that what we're describing here with this pair creation process and balancing gauge and gravitational sectors may not actually be a singularity of the heterotic theory at all. So even though the manifold is going singular, it may be that this is a smooth transition in the heterotic module. Um, what we've shown explicitly, even though we don't understand the field theory yet, is that we can control the geometry of these compactifications, their degrees of freedom and the potentials very explicitly, um, and we can show that they will match. Um, for certain types of compactifications um, without five brains, we have shown that this corresponds to a known ob observed effect in GLSMs, namely target space duality. And the fact that the spectra will match across target space duality, that was never proven in before in the GLSM literature or otherwise. 
So we've given a geometric interpretation to that and a proof that the spectrum will actually match across the target space duality procedure. Um, more generally, if we include five brains or just bundles that don't correspond to monads, et cetera, um, this duality is novel and it has lots of potential consequences. So um, just as an example of a couple of them, uh, it's clear that this pair creation effect of trying to balance gauge of gravitational sectors, I said this can be done with bundles, it can be done with five brains. There's nothing particularly special about heterotic in that context. So you could consider this same type of transition in other um, string effective settings, um, type two, for example. And you could also ask if it could be just so you, you know, as a gauge gravitational instanton type of transition, even in flat space, you could ask about this. So can this happen in a simpler setting or other theories? You can ask, what about other geometric transitions? Can we perform the same deal with flops? And we're trying to finish that up now. Um, what happens if you have an F theory dual? What does that mean to move in the moduli space in that way? Um, I will comment that this has actually been thought about before. I had a paper a number of years ago where I was like, oh, I wonder what target space duality looks like in the F theory dual. Um, this is a real pain because uh, monad bundles, converting them to spectral covers to map them across into F theory is just a horrible process. So the fact that we can do this more directly for any type of bundle makes that question now more tractable. And most importantly, from my point of view, is that this is giving us some sort of hint about a much broader moduli space of heterotic classifications. If you could really argue that these are effectively smooth transitions across this conifold, this means that the heterotic moduli space could have quite a rich structure across the whole Calabiao uh, network that I showed on the first slide. It also raises the question of what is the minimal information I have to tell you about a manifold in a bundle to specify the field theory. So the so-called walls data for a Calabiao threefold, that tells you what geometry, what a type two um, bit of physics is going to observe about a Calabiao geometry. We could ask the same thing now for manifolds and bundles. So I'm probably out of time, but I'm excited about this and I hope that I've raised at least some open questions that might increase people's further. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you you know, I think there are definitely hints from the structure of what's happening with these. So what's happening to the, the gauge fields and the, the cotangent bundle is very explicit. It's well understood what's happening to the, the cotangent bundle. And if our procedure works, then yes, we should be able to extrapolate sort of all the, the information about the curvature on both sides. But I have Uh, I think it's a very nice talk. I would say that uh, when you go learn about the film, it's going to This is a talk about the fact that there are individual species. Uh, it's kind of too hot. It's very hot. It's very hard. But they could be turned into each other. They would have a little bit longer. Uh, but I think they're very happy with like, starting to have a map of this thing. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, um, is it um, um, so this is something that James has started thinking about, so maybe he wants to comment. Um, so it, it's complicated, it's a few hundred and fifty at the moment, but um, some of the things you want to be showing that the film website is saying that you have the zeros. Some of them might be don't, and uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that being the range of constituality, being the duality through to not to the and understanding of it with a funding way of the So that's a long way from the But they don't have to try to yeah. Yeah. Not that we don't get any. No, no. In fact, that's one thing I can say. That having three factors to zero exactly tuned the plane of dimension. Right. Well, um, uh, you see the reason because usually when you have a bubble between there are many demands, and then you expect the bargains to get to each other when you use them for the representatives. But we have to read the algorithm and we get some other time. Even if you have uh, many representatives. Yeah, there's some technical requirements about that. But if I recall correctly, in that case, they had portion for any other things. Yeah, there's only in part of the 
Yeah, to, to summarize, there does seem to be some conspiracies in the Intifada facts we've looked at so far that I, I want to say this with great trepidation, but look like everything is matching and not obstructed. But there's clearly more work that needs to be done on that topic. I, I am hopeful that that is going to fall out. Yeah. There's lots of other types of things you could assume for, for Calabria threefolds. If you're moving to boundaries of the Kaler cone, there's really only the what can happen here. So collapsing to ones, you can also have divisors shrink into points. Those you know are not transitionable. So divisor shrinking to points is a full boundary. There's nothing on the other side of the, the Columbia moduli space at that point. You can, however, have sort of multiple walls coming in at the same time. So you can collapse lots of different T1s on top of each other. And we have not written down sort of the prescription for that, but I expect that it could be done. So that's partial answer to your question. Just as another comment, in the heterotic theory, this looks like this isn't a Higgs Coulomb branch transition, weirdly. I mean, it doesn't appear to be branch change at all. It appears to be just the moduli space, which is interesting. So yeah, I, I don't know. We have not, of course, proved that because we don't have the full control. Um, and just to return to the comment, don't have field theoretic control precisely because we're using things like small instanton transitions to describe this, which we don't have good field theoretic control of even by itself. So before you put up singular geometry, but yeah, great question. And clearly this, what's branch structure, where can you go and what types of things can you attack with this is, is a great open question. Thank you.